women in, in their children. Um, the, the focus of, 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 the, uh, of the presentation here is um, you know, one of the strategies um, to improve. If you go into, if you think about, if someone said, we want you to go to Zambia, for example, and you're going to improve health care. Well, one of the major areas you would eventually think about is, well, how do we improve the pre-service education system, the, the medical and nursing schools, so that the, uh, if we do that, as in the U.S., the graduates come out, they already have the knowledge and the skills, and they're already ready to, to go to work and provide quality services. So you might think, well, we need to go into the pre-service education system. Uh, the other major strategy was, but, but let me back that pre-service for a moment. Um, pre-service can have a long-term impact on the health care of a country, but it, it's very difficult to do. It takes years to work uh, with, with curriculum and improving faculties, teaching skills, and your clinic skills, but if you can accomplish that, the graduates come out with the knowledge and skills, but it takes time. So the other strategy that is, is often used is the in-service training system, is to go into uh, government health care systems or um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that maybe operate hospitals or clinics, and work with the in-service training system, where you take the doctors, nurses, midwives, or whatever cadre, and, and, and bring them together for in-service training courses. And so um, a lot of the work that uh, I was involved in the folks in the training office was working in pre-service education as well as in-service training. And our challenge, the main challenge we uh, uh, ran into, one of the primary challenges uh, was how to ensure that the, uh, the providers actually apply these on the job. In other words, that the training stick. If you do an infection prevention course you can spend a lot of time doing an analysis and designing a phenomenal course design, and very interactive activities and role plays and group activities and yaha moments and flip charts on the walls and people come out and you have good food at the breaks and good meals and everybody just is ecstatic, it's wonderful. But if you follow up two weeks later to those clinics and find out none of those healthcare providers are applying the, inf the uh, infection prevention practices they learned, then you just wasted a, a, a whole lot of time and money. And so the folks who sign the check, who are paying for the training, those are the, 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 the we usually refer to them as the key stakeholders. Um, and that might be, in our case, you know, got the government organizations or whatever that look at healthcare in that country as well as the, the funding agencies. They asked very tough questions. In fact, a lot of them said, we don't care about the course evaluations. We assume you're going to design a great course. You're going to deliver a great course. The test scores will be great. That's all given. We know that's going to happen. What we want to know is two weeks later, two months later, two years later, are those providers changing their job performance? And so we need to make sure, we had to stop and think, well, how do we make sure the transfer of learning so we, we, we tried to say we can't just focus on the, the training event itself. We had, to, we had to start thinking, wait a minute, there, there's things we need to do before training, during training, and after training. And that led us to uh, uh, Broad Newstrom's book, and, and this was published many years ago. Um, it's still available through Amazon and, and maybe the publisher. Um, if you're going to be a lifelong um, instructional designer, professional, uh, a trainer. I would strongly recommend picking up a copy of this book as one of the classics and, and just read the book. And we really lucked out because um, I, I started to do some, some research and found out that Mary Broad lived in Maryland, reached out to her and she was ecstatic. She came, met with us um, free of charge, spent a couple of days with us and we picked her brain and adapted things from her book to develop our transfer of learning guide. Um, and, and by the way, um, some may say, well, her book was transfer of Rod and Neustrom, their book was, was transfer of training. We use transfer of learning because in our world we were working with pre-service education and folks in education, the education world oftentimes don't care for the term training. 
Um, and, but learning applied to both the in-service training as well as the, uh, the pre-service education. So I would strongly recommend them picking up a copy of, of their book. Um, so the primary purpose of the guide we put together was to, um, um, and using um, our experience as, as coupled with uh, the input from Mary Broad in, in their book, <coughs> was to look at um, what are specific strategies and things that you can do before, during, and after training to ensure that the transfer of knowledge and skills to improve performance on the job. And um, Dr. Williams already gave you a copy of, of, of the guide we put together a few years ago. Here's the web link. If you go to uh, ReproLine Plus is the website, and that stands for Reproductive Healthcare Online. But they have, uh, there's a variety of other documents that are public domain that relate to um, performance improvement, transfer of training, and, and other topics. So uh, go look around, download those, add them to your electronic library. Um, so the purpose of this guide was for those designing training, but it was also, um, and again, depending on your organization, um, we would sit in Baltimore, Maryland, at Hopkins and design a course but the people who were selecting the course participants might be in Zambia or in Vietnam or Nepal somewhere. And so we had to work closely with the folks in country um, to help apply some of these strategies to make sure that they were aware there was things, it wasn't just as simple as, you know, oh, there's going to be a course and get a, get a venue and get some food and breaks and get the AV set up and have a nice course and put it all up and go back to work that there were things we expected. Um, when you start to build in transfer of training strategies, it oftentimes gets messy and complicated because you start getting in other people's business. Um, you start, you need to, as we'll see in just a minute or a few minutes, to work with the supervisors of those who are um, going to be trained. Our experience was, and I'm sure it's, it's universal in any field, is that um, if, if I'm a supervisor and someone in my department is selected to go to a course and I had no input into selecting them or anything, it's just a numbers thing, they needed somebody, it's really unlikely when that person returns to work that I'm going to sit down with them and say, what did you learn? How do we improve your job performance? How do we, what can I do to help you apply this? Um, they've got to be involved. So. Um, when you start looking at, at this more holistically and thinking who else needs to be involved, it goes from the people who are writing the, 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 the checks to the supervisors, even to the colleagues that work with the individuals being trained. Um, now, several of you in your, in your questions, now someone had asked, you know, does this uh, concept apply if you're doing, um, you know, I forget what it was, said, well, I can see where this applies if you're doing group training, where you have a team or you have individuals, two or three from a, in our case, from a clinic that come together and they go back, they can support each other. But if you're doing individualized training, for example, the, the, what we're doing right now, if, if, if people are working as individuals, the transfer of training process still applies. What you want to do is to learn to think about um, the approach and then figure out what strategies can we apply, even if it's an individual to help support them when they when they go back to work to make sure they apply what they've learned. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those in a little bit. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt or put it in the chat, and, and uh, I'll feel, be glad to stop and um, address them. You know, Group is very quiet I tonight, Rick. Want to know is it, well, maybe maybe I'm talking too fast, but uh, I think you're doing fine. <laughs> um, you hate to think about it as an instructional designer or as a training uh, professional, uh, but training often fails. And when you say to a trainer, well, the training failed, and, and I've been training for years, we take it very personally. And we say, no, 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 look at the evaluations, look at the comments. Everyone loved it. And um, that really is irrelevant. It's important to us and it's important to the, to the participants during the event and you obviously want to have a successful um, uh, training course or, or intervention, whatever it's going to be. 
so that learning occurs. Um, but if there's other job performance problems, for example, if if um, um, and I'm going to use an example from healthcare because that was where this was was developed from, is if 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 in clinics and hospitals they were having high infection rates, they say, oh my gosh, we need an infection prevention course immediately. So you rush out, you design this, you put it together, you go in, you go through and do all this, and you go back and um, they go back to work, and, and two months later you find the rates haven't changed at all. Um, and then you go to the actual clinics and find out that, well, they don't have the supplies they're supposed to. And which seems like it'd be an obvious thing, but oftentimes no one's really looked at that and say, you know, there's a tendency, well, you want a training course design? I'm your person. I can design a great course for you. We need to make sure it's a performance problem that's addressed by improving the knowledge, skills, and I guess attitudes of, 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 of the workers and not other factors like do they have the tools and equipment, do they have the supplies, do they have supervisory support. If you go to the clinic and find out there's, there's no running water, um, well, that, if you had known that up front, that would have changed the design of your course. So really understanding the performance issues, which I'm sure in, in this or other courses you look at the performance improvement process and, and doing that needs assessment and looking at performance gaps and but you want to look at all the factors that affect that worker's performance and you want to really be sure that improving knowledge and skills will close that gap and improve performance. Now it may be you identify that there are several factors. One is lack of knowledge and skills, but there's also um, a lack of clear supervision and lack of supplies. Well, someone else may need to deal with those other two factors while you're dealing with the training piece of it. So again, when you start looking at the, the, the broader picture, there needs to be other folks involved, uh, typically, in the design, delivery, and evaluation of the training when you start looking at um, transfer of learning. The, um, um, in terms of the training design, um, again, you know, before you jump into the design of an intervention um, and make an investment, it's imperative to make sure, as I mentioned before, that the, uh, the, the performance issue can be fixed by training. And then um, you know, once you've invested in training, um, you want to make sure they're supported by, on the job by their organizations, the environment, their supervisors, and their coworkers. In our case, we use coworkers because they would go back to clinics where they had other health professionals. And in that, that list there, in that second bullet, uh, we found the key was their supervisor. And that when we uh, involve the supervisors, now let me go back to that infection prevention course for a moment. Let's say you were tasked with doing this. What we would have uh, done would be to try to bring the supervisors from the hospitals or clinics that, where you're going to uh, focus this intervention before you ever develop the training or while it's being designed, bring those folks together, uh, orient them to the, to the problem, get their input, get their input so you can use their input into the design of the course and the content. What you're doing, you're getting their buy-in and support um, so that when they then are asked to select individuals to go to the training um, and then you ask those supervisors to support their co the, the, uh, uh, the trainees when they come back after the training, that really facilitates the transfer. So anytime you're designing training, think about the supervisors of those that are going to be attending your courses and think, have we involved them uh, in, in, in any needs assessment? Have they been involved in, did we get their input into the training design? Um, and so we'll look at those specific strategies when we get to the, to the matrix in a few minutes. So again, um, you're looking at this more, uh, more broadly. We put together this transfer learning matrix, which is basically this, the same kind of matrix that's in Broad and Newstrom's book. Um, we had four categories and we wanted to say, okay, what, what, do, um, what do supervisors need um, before, during, and after training? What do the trainers need to do before, during, and after training? The same for the learners and the same for the co-workers and others. Um, in Broad and Newstrom's book, they don't include the co-workers and others. Um, 
but they do include the supervisors, the trainers, and the, and the learners. And, and but again, that was um, uh, that was our approach for because of the again the nature of of, of, of healthcare. What I'd like to do is to um, um, walk through the cells of the matrix and and hit them just on some of these key points. And several of you had asked questions about you know which strategies. And again, when you um, when you really think about the process and ask yourself the, the questions from this matrix, and it, again, it can apply to any type of training, um, you'll find yourself identifying, well, what are the appropriate things we can do in, in, in our work? Because obviously, um, everyone here is going to be in a different environment when they're working in the, um, if they're working in the instructional design or delivery of training. To meet our needs, we looked at what the supervisors, uh, in terms of before learning, as I mentioned a little bit ago, we want to make sure that, that the supervisors of the people being trained understood the performance need. Um, they have a very clear picture of, of, of the job performance of their workers, what's, what they're supposed to do, the ideal. Um, involve them in any training assessments, um, involve them in the uh, selection of learners. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the big killers in a lot of situations is if the supervisor doesn't have input, someone else decides a worker is going off to training course. Um, not only do they have a tendency not to support, sometimes they're irritated because now they're dealing with someone being gone and they may not want to support any change because they weren't involved in the decision-making process. So it's a critical, critical group. Um, those supervisors should be in some communications with the, uh, the trainers. And the other big key one is the action plan. And all of you are probably familiar with action plans. Um, what we try to suggest is that the supervisors and these healthcare clinics, before they would you know, select two nurses, midwives, or physicians, whoever was coming to training, um, so we would give them the form, sit down, um, give them the preliminary action plan. Now you think about your world for a moment. If your supervisor sits down with you and says, now we're going to send you to a five-day uh, course to learn new software implementation. Um, when you come back, here's what I expect. First, you're going to do an orientation to all the staff about what you learned. Uh, secondly, you're going to do this. Thirdly, you're going to do this. If I know those are the expectations before I go, that affects my performance during the course. On the other hand, if I know that nobody, when I get back, is going to care what I learned, then I may not pay as close attention, I may not get as much out of it, because I know there's no clear expectations for me to change my performance. But if I show up at a course and I've already got a preliminary action plan, and I know my supervisor expects specific um, me to do specific things when I get back, I'm going to make sure I really try to do that. Um, someone asked here, I guess it's Beth, about uh, how far in advance do you typically provide it to the learners. Um, in, in our situation in developing countries, sometimes that was difficult because of if you're in rural, you've gone to somewhere, getting physical paper out to folks was, was a challenge. Um, what we found, if you, if you get it too far in advance, then it gets shuffled and nothing happens with it. Um, what we tried to do is when that clinic was alerted that the course was coming up and they needed to select, and by the way, you need to have very clear uh, definition of or description of the, of the learners because um, I've done courses before where it was supposed to be um, nurses who provide a, a, a specific family planning service and all of a sudden, I literally had in one course had a guy who worked in, in uh, building maintenance who wasn't even a clinician. And when I said, why were you sent to this course, his response was, it was my turn to go to training. In other words, they looked at it as a benefit to get away from the site, to go to a site uh, for training, stay in a nice hotel, have some nice meals. So obviously, no one's changing performance. So back to Beth's question. Uh, I would tie the action plan in with um, notification that the training is available. Here's the criteria for participants in the training. 
And here are things we would suggest that um, you ask your workers to do upon returning after the training. So everybody's aware of this before they ever show up at the course. So um, that might be a week or so in advance, but enough time for that person, Beth, to sit down with their supervisor and say, okay, I guess everybody's serious about this. Um, and then when they show up at the course, I, we found that really changed their attitude. And then the supervisor is supporting and encouraging their, their learners to, in a very positive way. The, um, the trainers before learning um, the performance needs assessment, and you usually are not going to have the time to go in and do the ideal assessment that you find in all the textbooks and so forth. But you still can try to build in some, some performance needs assessments questions about the nature of the problem, and, and I'd like to try to actually go and talk to the people and see where the problem is occurring and ask questions about uh, are there other factors that are affecting performance, and that gets into the whole performance improvement um, uh, concept. So if you can't do a formal assessment, at least have some of those questions that you ask uh, before you start designing the training to make sure that if there are other factors, you've, you've taken those into consideration. You then, of course, use the instructional design learning principles you're learning in, in this and other courses. Um, and then we recommend, whenever possible, to send the course syllabus, which would include the objectives and any pre-course learning activities in advance. And again, it depends on the design of the course. Um, you've maybe been to courses, uh, leadership courses, where you're asked to complete some um, assessments online or, or other documents. or We've had courses where we've asked folks to um, uh, take photos of their, if they can, in their clinic or hospital uh, around infection prevention, bring those to share, uh, or other things you want them to do, which helps make the learning more relevant. Part of sending that syllabus and objectives out can also include the action plan, make it very clear their supervisor has one, and that they and the supervisor know at, by the end of training they're going to complete this action plan and the trainer is going to keep copies of those and that's part of the follow-up which we'll get to uh, after learning. The learners themselves would participate if, if requested or possible in any assessments. They'd go over the, the syllabus objectives, prepare their materials. Um, in our world we wanted them to establish a support network because when um, the nurses went back with new infection prevention practice we expected them to show those you know, how to wash hands and other things to the other nurses in the clinic. So we wanted a, a network when they went back. And again, that, that was the world we were in. You're, you're going to be in different worlds. But look at what is that person doing after training and how can we support them. In this case, we thought, well, we can support them to their supervisors, but we also can support them um, with the other workers at the, uh, the, the clinic and maybe and maybe when we had the funds follow up from the actual uh, trainers. Um, and then the co-workers, if appropriate, any needs assessments. And we always said, you make sure you bring back key learning points to share with, the, uh, with that support group. Uh, this is helpful if you're doing a course and, and part of your design is to prepare job aids of some sort that you want to take back. Uh, you would encourage the learners, look, this job aid is to assist you but you may be going back and sharing some of your knowledge and skills with, with other workers in your unit and you know, share the job aids with them so, you, so there can be some um, additional uh, improvement in performance. In terms of, of, of during learning, supervisors, we would invite them um, to participate in or observe if appropriate. Um, and again, whenever we do, uh, I was doing a I'm, not, I'm now with the iron workers, and we were doing a superintendent training course. If you picture a construction, a large construction site, you've got iron workers, and you have them in small groups and crews with a foreman, but then you have a general foreman or superintendent that kind of supervises the foreman. Whenever we do a superintendent training course, we invite the, uh, the contractor, the employer of that superintendent. They don't always come. We invite them to attend, and when they do, it really helps because that person in the course sees their supervisor coming in, observing, nodding, seeing what's going on, it's more likely afterwards they're going to change their performance because they know this, this training really has the support of their supervisor. 
We also want to protect learners from interruptions. Those that have done a lot of training know that one of the biggest challenges is the people in the course getting calls, getting emergencies, got to deal with this, got to deal with that. And we would encourage the supervisors to say, look, and this was a problem we had doctors, is to, during that three, four day course, whatever the time frame was, please try not to contact them, interrupt them, let, them, let us focus solely on the, uh, the training. Um, the supervisors during the course can plan for the post-training debriefing. So when the person comes back after training, what's that debriefing look like? And then while that person attending training, making sure they have the, uh, the supply, space, schedule opportunities for practice, um, trying to think about when that person goes back to work, what can I do as a supervisor to make sure I remove all barriers and help them apply these knowledge and skills when they, uh, when they return. And again, I keep stressing the supervisor because this person is, is really critical. Uh, the trainer during the learning, this is the fun part. For uh, This is the part I love. I love being in the classroom. Um, but during training, you're going to provide work-related exercises and appropriate job aids. Um, and by work-related exercises, you really, if you've done your homework well as an, a designer and really understand that person's work environment, you want to make your work-related exercises as real as possible. And um, give them case studies, activities, problem solving, so they're constantly thinking about the work world and then job aids to support that. Of course, giving immediate clear feedback, helping them develop very realistic action plans. Um, I, I try not, I was just doing a seminar last week, it was just a one day seminar. At the end of the day, we, we had about an hour or so, we broke into groups, um, and these were folks from, from various local, uh, ironworker locals around the particular part of the country. And they worked on action plans. And I gave them an hour or so. Um, and then we went from table to table looking at the action plan saying, well, can you really do it that way? What's a better way? This other group. And then I have them share their action plans. And what's interesting about that is and you watch one group share theirs, you'll see the other group go, oh, that's a great idea. So hearing other people's action plans reinforces, again, this whole concept of the training is great. But the real focus is on what happens next week when I go back to work and how do I make a, a difference in my job and uh, performance. And then doing evaluations during training, the tests, skill evaluations, the assessments we normally do. Um, the learners during training, basically, we, ask, we suggest two things. Actually participate and develop realistic action plans. And again, if that's an expectation by their supervisor, and they know when they go back, they're expected to do it, they're likely to do both bullets on that, uh, that slide. The, uh, the co-workers, um, they complete their uh, any reassigned work duties. In our world, in the healthcare world, what happened, if you pull out a doctor, a nurse, midwife, someone else had to cover uh, for that person. So um, again, that's one of the reasons, because of the nature of our world, we had to think about how does that happen? Who's covering that? And uh, so forth. And then when after the training, participate in any learning exercises that, the, uh, that they need to do. And now looking after training, the training is done. And this is when a lot of trainers stop and say, great, I pack up my stuff. I pack up all the things. I look at the evaluations and um, fill out my reports. And they think, great, that was a great course. And we want you to feel that way. It should be if you've done a good job designing it. However, the people paying for training, they're really only interested in one thing, a change in performance after training. And someone asked in, in one of the questions, how do you get that buy-in and support? And what I found, if you can find the key stakeholder who's writing the checks, who's paying for this, and say, point out, obviously there's organizational costs to have these individuals go through training. Um, but if we don't think about how we apply it afterwards, we're wasting that money. That gets their attention. No one's going to say, oh, I'm not interested in, in change in job performance. They all want change in job performance. That's why there's courses going on if it's a performance problem. So if the supervisor afterwards is, again, monitoring progress, the action plan, revising as necessary, um, doing a post-training debriefing when they get back, sitting down with that person, the coworkers. Tell us about the course. Show us what you learned. 
what can we do differently, what did you find out, how can we help you support, and that kind of discussion, uh, being a coach and a role model. In some training designs, you may recommend that, that the actual supervisors go through the training first. And, and then, again, this will depend on your world and on the environment, but in some cases, putting the supervisors through the course. For example, I know someone mentioned, I think one of their questions, they were rolling out um, new software, uh, I think in a hospital setting. Um, that's a perfect example. I would probably say, well, let, but the first people should be trained are the work, are the supervisors in the various units where you're going to roll this out first. Bring those folks in, make sure they're competent, skilled, they feel comfortable with it, and they have their own action plans, and then they can coach and, and, and role model for um, their, their, uh, their employees when they come through the training. Um, that supervisor is going to evaluate the learner's performance. And if you're an organization that, that has uh, um, performance assessments, job assessments, and so forth, part of that supervisor's job is evaluating that person's uh, performance. And then we encourage those supervisors to stay in touch with the trainers. If there's implementation problems, there's challenges, let us know. What can we do to help? What can we send you? How can we support it? Um, so uh, but that has implications. If, you, uh, if you're rolling out training, say, okay, we're going to roll this out. We're going to do 10 courses with 15 people. We each have 150 participants. Now, there's only two trainers trying to provide follow-up a, a support to 150 people is going to be critical. Is going to be very difficult to do, uh, which is another reason for having those supervisors to help also with that uh, after training support. The trainers um, conducting any follow up. We did follow up uh, at Chapago. We had another unit that monitoring and evaluation. Um, whenever possible, we tried to have our, our regional clinical trainers go to the sites. Uh, we would we had checklists that we used during training. So I'll go back to the infection prevention. It was really like a job aid. And so if during training they said, well, look, these are the 22 infection prevention steps, um, and they used that for practice. We used that same checklist for skill assessment. When they went back to work, their supervisor and they had copies of it, and that was the same instrument that was used at the job to see if they're performing it. A trainer comes to do a follow-up visit. They're using that same checklist. Um, it just reinforces the... Um, that. You see, Matthew says, um, he's asking about the, uh, the supervisor training. Do you modify the course for them to teach them how to coach? That's an excellent question, Matthew. Um, I've, I've done that some in my current position, and uh, what we did is we had a three-day course. Um, and when we did the supervisor version of it, it was a four-day course. And they went through the exact same course the workers were going through. And the same expectations, they knew exactly what their workers were going to face. They came out competent. They took the same test and everything. The fourth day was their roles. and how, how do you coach? How do you observe someone? How do you give feedback? How do you use the checklist to assess their performance and make sure that, that, that they are doing according to standards? So absolutely, it's a very good question. Um, other times, it may be a matter of just orienting the supervisor. Um, but, but again, if, 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 if that supervisor really is going to be rolling up his or her sleeves and coaching, assessing, and actually doing it along with the workers, then yes, I would put them through the exact same course, but also give them an introduction to how, how to be a, a good job coach. Excellent question. Um, again, the trainers can help strengthen the supervisor's uh, skills, um, help review action plans with supervisors. You know, you, call up that supervisor, or I'm going to stop by. Um, I'd like to sit down with you and, and uh, the person went through the course, look at the action plan, see how I can help. And again, that supervisor, knowing that, that there's still ongoing interest, is still a, an additional uh, incentive to make sure that the workers are changing their performance. Um, sharing your observations with supervisors and learners. If, you're, if you have the luxury as a trainer to conduct the training and then also do a follow-up where you actually go see the people you were training, apply this on the job, um, giving them that, going that coaching role that Matthew asked about, uh, giving that learner feedback, but also sharing those observations with the supervisor um, and reinforcing learning. Hopefully it's mostly positive feedback, but also if there are 
barriers or problems, trying to facilitate discussions, how to remove those barriers and solve those problems. And again, maintaining communications. And of course, this can be done electronically. If you're going to do a, a big rollout uh, of training, if you're a large organization, um, you might have a, uh, um, a, a website or an area uh, just for those who have been through training with frequently asked questions, success stories, um, job aids, uh, new things that come up, uh, sending out emails, connecting them with maybe some sort of a list server where they can communicate about the... So they, there's a network of people and they can see success stories of others and how they're doing it. Um, that just, again, encourages people to apply the skills that they uh, learn during the training. Uh, the learners, again, when they get back, they meet with that supervisor, go over the action plan, uh, they apply the new skills, to implement that action plan, use the job aids they were given during the course, uh, network with other learners and trainers for support, and, and monitor your, their own performance so that when they go back, they're monitoring they have the checklist, they have the job aids, they, they know if they're doing it according to standard, and if they know that their supervisor is going to be observing the check on that, and know the trainer is going to be coming by at some point, they're more likely to, again, change their performance, and that, is, that was the whole purpose of the training to begin with. Um, the co-workers after learning is basically being supportive of the, of the learner's accomplishments. And, um, and again, they're going to be involved in uh, hopefully learning some of those skills from the from the worker. And and basically that uh, now, Greg, that was a pretty fast 45 minutes, but uh, um, that was the basic concept. Um, and I guess I'd like to you know open up to questions. And if not, I can I can also refer to a few of the questions that were that were sent in. Uh, Greg, any suggestions how you'd like to proceed? Greg, are you there? Yes, I'm okay. sorry. My my mic was there. muted and oh. I forgot. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> I know you I know you're you're taking I know your son's there. I didn't know if he was had dragged you out of there. I just uh, um, I was just summarizing and I said it was a quick it was a quick forty five minutes overview of the of the and, and the the nice thing about I mean the good news with transfer learning, the the, the concepts and principles are are fairly simple. They're, they're fairly common sense kinds of things. Implementation can be a nightmare um, and, and it can get very messy. And, and a lot of trainers say, well, I'm going to let someone else worry about that. I'm going to design a phenomenal course and deliver my course and I'll go on and feel very good about that. But if it's not changing job performance, you're wasting your time and money. So, Greg, my question was as to, um, uh, we obviously have plenty of time now, as to whether I wanted to open up and take some questions now or, or if I should go through some of the questions people sent in. Uh, what's your recommendation? Well, I, I would say you could open it up to questions in general and then if there's a lull, you can uh, just uh, uh, then visit the questions that they submitted prior to uh, tonight. Okay, we can do that. Okay. All right. Anybody got a, a question, you can put it in the chat or, or um, bring your mic on and, and ask the question. Come on, folks, don't be shy. This is a great topic. Hi, this is Darren. I, I have a question. Sure. Um, we actually have, are implementing a transfer of learning at the um, healthcare organization where I work in mm -hmm. Wheaton, Maryland. And um, we do have a work plan, and we go through several steps with the job aids, and we have accountability where we ask for the supervisors to submit in information, but we're still struggling with evaluating if they're actually actually implementing once they get back on the job. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a follow-up with the supervisors, but everything you know in a hospital is extremely fast and it's always a rush. Every, everything is at the last minute. Can you give me any suggestions on how we can kind of, um, how we can evaluate it? You're talking about evaluating the actual train, the person went through training, evaluating their application of their new knowledge and skills in the in the work environment. In the yes. Workplace. Well, the the um, Sarah, the you're, you're probably already doing this, and again, the hospital is a very complex place, as you well know. Um, the, the two most, well, three most common one is self-assessment. That's a little uh, difficult. People are 
can look at their own if they, they, they know what the skills are. But the two most common is uh, of, of having somebody in the unit or their supervisor who um, you know, has the same uh, list of steps, the same job, a checklist, um, actually observing them, performing that skill, um, and giving feedback and so forth. The other is that the, the trainer, the, the, the person who conducted the training, coming in to do that. Um, and there's pros and cons with, with both. And the other challenge in, in particularly in a hospital setting is if you have a skill like infection prevention, which you can go in and see the clinicians do it all day, every day, you're always going to see it. On the other hand, if it's a specific procedure or practice that they may not do constantly, trying to arrange to be there when they perform that skill, and they're, but you've got clients that are also there and so forth, it gets, it gets more complicated. Um, so, you know, those are the, the, the two most common approaches in healthcare. If you found that, uh, what, what, what is the approach, you say you're using having the supervisors do that assessment? Yes, we, the supervisors normally do the assessment and the information is filtered back to the home office. Um, they collect the data and then share it with, you know, share it with the trainers, see if there's a need for retraining. Mm -hmm. um, but the training staff is small and again, everything runs at hyperspeed. Right. So uh, a lot of times things fall off the table because we had to move on to something else. Right. Um, other than now, I, are the the, uh, uh, the supervisors, are they subject matter experts too? They're also clinicians? Yes, they're clinicians. Yeah. Well, I would, that, what you're doing is the most common approach. Um, I'm not sure I have any additional things you can do other than um, working with the supervisors to make sure they feel comfortable with the coaching and observing. Uh, the reality is when you do this right, if you have the Cadillac version, to take the time to go observe the person, give them feedback, and, and feel out of that, it, that if you're doing that for each employee, that takes time, and often in a healthcare setting, they don't have the extra time to do that. So right. um, uh, it sounds like you're doing the right things. I'm not sure if I can add much more to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me see, I have a couple of questions here, I think. Let me uh, get back up here. Uh, Joe asked, uh, what efforts do you take to, um, to self the endpoint, the desired idea of future? How do you get buy-in and engage with innovation? Uh, now, Joe, you're, you're talking about the, um, trying to get the buy-in and support for the endpoint. Um, what the goal? Can you tell me who who are you looking at in terms of uh, trying to get the buy-in and support? All levels of the organization. Um, yeah, I guess I guess what I'm trying to ask is, um, I, I mean the the effort the effort that people are going to put out when they come to the training and afterwards is uh, based on. How much they're, how much they're engaged or enrolled or, um, um, how much motivation they have to get to, you know, this sort of new picture of, of, uh, you know, instead of having all these infections, having a, a non-infection, a no infection or low infection, mm -hmm. um, reality. I, I mean, I, I guess I'm just asking how, you know, it seems like the success of the whole thing is dependent on how much how motivated you can get the supervisors and the learners. Well, you're exactly right. The, 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 the key is, is even before you start designing or putting together the training, is to make sure you have uh, support from the key stakeholders. And the stakeholders are varied from organization to organization, from problem to problem. If you can link um, a performance problem to the vision for the organization and show that in order for us to, to, to achieve our vision, um, to reach our goals, um, we have to overcome this problem. And we think that, that part of the solution to this problem is a job performance issue. There may be some other issues in here, organizational issues, uh, supervisory issues, uh, some, I mean, some having the right supplies, tools, and equipment. There may be other issues. But for the performance part of it, we're going to design a training. 
And uh, but we need in order to maximize what we're about to spend on the training part of this, because training isn't cheap. And to, and to use your term, Joe, we'll make it sure the training sticks. You want that buy-in and support up front. And because if you don't have the buy-in and support up front, particularly from, from those who are paying for the training or from those in the supervisory role, then those who come to the training are not going to be feel there's any pressure for them to come and really learn and apply this because they don't see any they don't see the uh, uh, the urgency in your organization for this they don't see the linkage between um, what the performance problem is um, how improving their job performance will solve that problem and how that links to the organizational goals and so it's key to try to identify who your your key stakeholders are and get their support up front. You don't have that support up front, it becomes very, very difficult. You can design a great course, people have fun, and the evaluations look good, but it may not really contribute to the, uh, um, as you said, aiming to you know, where you want to end up, what the, what, what the goals are. You, that needs to be agreed upon uh, up front with those stakeholders. You know, and Carolyn asks, um, do you have other post-training materials resources you recommend post-training besides job aids? Um, I mean, is it, I don't know if it's Carolyn, Carolyn or Caroline. I work with two different ones, and they don't they pronounce their names differently. But uh, it's Caroline. Thanks Car for asking. <laughs> no problem. Um, I, I learn wrong once, pronounce it wrong one way, and you remember forever. <laughs> um, I I use the term job aids, but it can mean many different things. In 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 the old days, BC before computers, we thought of job aids as you know something you physically handed to folks, and if you go to uh, McDonald's and looked at the uh, behind the counter. A, you might be scared to death, but um, you're going to see job aids all over the place, all over the equipment, the steps to do all kinds of things. So there's there's signs, there's checklists, there's but now in this electronic world, um, we do a training course on how to use an online um, uh, tracking system for apprentices, and people we do the do the course is. A, 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 like a webinar based, we can take over their computer and show them how to do it. We have a live course, they want to come to that. Um, but the other thing we found out is that they, they still were having issues. So we, we, we decided to shoot, uh, and I say shoot, we use free software and that, that basically captures whatever's on the computer screen and you can record audio with it. So we did right in the office. We had, we had the guy that taught the course, sat down and said it was a computer course. And we identified the top 25 skills people had problems with, and he made um, basically sat, moved his mouse around the screen, recorded the steps to explain how that how that function worked. We recorded them ourselves, put them on our online learning center, so it's very little costs. And so I looked at those as a job aid. Now it's an electronic kind of a piece of media, but it's still to me is a job aid. So I think you have to look and say, what are things we can uh, design and sometimes you'll get suggestions from those in the course. And if I have time in a course, I like to have a brainstorming session, um, three fourths of the way through the course, to say, okay, flip chart time. Tell me some reasons why you won't be able to apply this next week. Tell me the barriers. What's going to stop you from doing this? And let them work in groups, identify those, put them on the flip charts, and that may open your eyes up. But that's the kind of discussion you should have before you design the course. Um, but Identifying those barriers, some of those are things that are going to be organizational issues, but some of them may be as simple as, oh, well, we could put that checklist together, those list of steps together, or we could put something online, or we could shoot a video, whatever it is that will help um, support their performance and overcome that, that barrier. So, Carolyn, hope that, hope, that, hope that helps. It does help. Thank you. I, I think mm -hmm. the video t tutorials are helpful. People sometimes learn more by seeing than reading the steps, right. you know, so that definitely will help. Good. Um, Sarah says, I've been charged with doing the same task. Um, what free screen capture software did you use? Well, I'm not a techie, um, but my email address is there on the, on, the, on the screen, Sarah, and if you'll email me, um, I will email you. I'll ask the, the, the tech guy at work who recorded these what software you use. I know that Adobe has a software that's called um, Captivate that does that, but uh, someone else in the office had found a free software. Um, but someone just said Adobe Captivate um, is great for screen capture. You can check on that one. 
and I know that's one that's that's that's, that's really good. But there are also some some free ones available. Um, ours we we went low budget and low dollar and didn't invest much to put it together. Um, but if you get Adobe Capri, that's the one that was recommended. But we also if you'll email me, um, I'll be glad to try to find out um, what software is being used. The um, let me. I'm looking. Uh, well, you don't have any budget either, Sarah. Welcome to welcome to reality. <laughs> you, you talk about all these great things you can do on no budget. So, uh, um, someone else is saying uh, snag it. So I'm assuming that's a uh, a similar software. The um, I wanted to take a, a quick look and like a glance through some of your questions. Um, See if we, there's ones we haven't had. Um, Alice asked the question. The um, says tra training is not the, the appropriate approach for fixing an issue, but the clients employees are determined to use training, and that, I think that's a very common uh, situation, Alice. And people like to use training because they can they can put it in reports and say, well, we. We trained 183 people. We did. We conducted 12 courses. It's easy to count. It's easy to count and say, okay, we spent this much money, and here's how much money we spent per person for training. It's a, it's a it's a it's it's an event. It's a visible event. People like going to it. They see the flip charts. They see the donuts and bagels. It's something's going on. Those are all great things. But uh, again, what you want to try to do is um, you want to make sure your client and again whoever's paying for the training. Is is aware of concerns. This may, may not be a training issue. And again, I would try to have questions and say, "Well, okay, we can certainly do this training. Uh, can I have a discussion with you about how will we know if the training worked? What do you want to see changed? And what you're trying to do is to lead that that client to see that oh, it may be more than just the training." And you know, now the bottom line is, if someone pays me, I don't care. I want you to anyway. Well, we can, I can design and deliver great training, um, but um, you want to ask those key questions. Um, if they still want training, knock their socks off to the best job you can. And uh, oh, I got a long one here. Um, someone asked, said, if, if the learners in a training are there to learn the skills of employ. For their own business rather than the organization, um, would one way to evaluate transfer learning be on follow-up surveys? And um, yeah, I think this. Um, uh, I think the uh, Lynn, you'd ask this in, in your questions about uh, um, teaching yoga, and uh, again, that's going to be a very different situation. If um, if I go out to organizations and say I'm, I'm going to offer. Um, for example, let's say I'm going to do um, uh, management, you know, offer a management course for people running a small business, and I organize this, and I got a five-day course on management principles, how to manage your small business, and how to communicate with your customers, how to market, and I go through all that. People elect and choose to come to that and go back to apply it in their small business. Organizationally, I don't have a connection to them, so it makes it much more difficult to to build an organizational. Um, transfer of learning principles. Having said that, I can still try to think about um, when that person is done and goes back. Um, how can I support them? Because if, if in this case you're you're they're, they're going back to teach yoga, if they, what they learn from you, if they're if you can help them be successful um, in their business, successful, they're successful, then you're going to have more business. So. Obviously, you want them to be successful. So, so try to, again, the same thing during your course. Ask them um, what are the challenges you're going to have in applying this and in doing this, and how can I help support that? Um, now, if you're an entrepreneur, I'm not sure the situation. If you're an entrepreneur, um, you may, Lynn, you may say, um, I'm going to conduct this training course, and you know, for additional cost, I can come to your to your <laughs> business. Observe, coach, assist, and whatever if, if that's uh, you know appropriate. But again, it's, it's trying to look at that person and say, 
help them look at what are the barriers they're going to have, applying what they've learned in your course, and how can you help them in advance uh, or even during uh, when they're actually back in operation, eliminate those, uh, those barriers. I hear someone's fingers hitting a keyboard, so I'm going to see if anything pops up, but I'm going to glance. Um, the, uh, someone asked about the thoughts on transfer of learning, I think it was uh, Megan, um, thoughts on transfer of learning of knowledge versus skills. And um, this is, is, is I, I think, similar to the question I had a bit ago. A lot of the examples I've given this evening are in skills, and it's sometimes a little easier. Um, for example, if an organization, they felt we want to uh, uh, bring supervisors together and do a training course on communications. You probably all work for a supervisor you thought could use communication skills training. Well, it, it becomes a little more difficult following that to go back and observe them communicating. I mean, obviously you could come up with indicators, but trying to go observe them communicate with their workers is a little more difficult. So it, the, 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 I think the transfer is a little more challenging if it's knowledge only or even really difficult when it's attitudinal. It's a little easier when it's skill performance because you can observe them and know if they're doing it to standard or not. Um, when you get into the soft skills and attitudinal kind of skills, it's more challenging. Uh, again, that's why I think in the design phase of having discussions with the, uh, the stakeholders and so forth to say, okay, we can certainly put our supervisors, we can find a, an existing consultant with a phenomenal communication skills course and bring them in and put these supervisors through a couple days supervisor communication skills. We can do videotaping and so forth. But what's the follow-up? How do we maintain that enthusiasm in the course? How do we reinforce that with their supervisors um, and so forth? So again, it's just trying to look at the problem from every issue, every from every angle you can to think about. But let's keep focusing on how do we keep this moving after the training, or how do we make sure they're applying it um, when it's over? So I think the the softer skills are more of a challenge. It can still be done. It's just a little more challenging and a little uh, a little messier. She, Megan also asked about the um, online. Um, how you sure transfer learning when the course is online and 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 asynchronous. Um, again, I like to always, the very first point is, what is the performance issue? If, if an organization is going to spend money on training, they're doing it to solve a performance problem. And if it truly is a performance problem, a lack of knowledge, skills, and abilities or attitudes, fine, we design that. And if the delivery method is going to be online, we still need to think, okay, we can figure out, and I'm sure Dr. Williams and the courses at UMBC will talk about how do we assess that online and do it, assessments and so forth. But once the course is over and they're back in their environment, um, it, it was it a software course, was it a, a knowledge-based uh, communication supervisory course, what was it? And how organizationally are we going to reinforce that to make sure it's being applied? Who's this person's supervisor if they have one? What's their work environment? Uh, who they report to, um, and trying to figure out the, the best way um, to, to su support them after training, but also make it very clear there's an organizational expectation that performance is going to change. We need to see this being applied uh, because, and again, I've said it many times, after training, if I don't see that my supervisor doesn't care if I apply it, 99 times out of 100, I'm not going to do it. If the book goes on the shelf and that's the end of it. So we just need to wrap, try to wrap our heads around uh, the best way to do that. Um, let's see. I'm trying to flip through a couple of the, uh, some more questions here. Um, so what works best for strengthening supervisor skills? Uh, this one came in from Beth. Uh, Beth asked, uh, and there are the questions, what works best for strengthening supervisor skills so they can better support employees? And, and again, I made a note that that was an excellent question. And getting those supervisors um, 
their skills up to speed, again, you want to assess what's that supervisor's role. And back to the question earlier in the hospital environment when I asked the question, is that supervisor also a clinician providing uh, skill practice? The answer is yes. Then that supervisor needs to go through the exact same course, uh, be able to perform the exact same skills, and also be taught how to coach, do some coaching role plays, practice, how do you give feedback, maybe if you've got the time and the resources, videotapes, they, they see how you provide feedback, how you don't provide feedback, and coach and help their workers. Um, at a minimum, I think that supervisor needs to have some involvement in um, assessment questions, if not a formal needs assessment, um, some input into the design of the training, input into selecting who's attending training, um, maybe come to a couple hour orientation, to, here's an overview of the training, but here's the action plan, and here's the organizational expectation, which means going to the supervisor or the supervisors and making sure that, yes, we roll this out, we expect every supervisor is going to have an action plan for anybody who goes to training. That's part of the expectation. So everyone expects it as part of it. It's built into the training. And, and again, that's the more challenging part of, of, of this is getting all that other buy-in. But those supervisors in the preparing them are, are, are critical. Um, Let me move on, see if I've got some other good questions here. Um, they say, uh, I, I think it's also Beth asked, uh, what do you do when time is limited? Well, that's normally the case. Um, I was in the Marine Corps, and we always laughed and said everything was hurry up and wait. And that's the military model. Um, the same thing with training. All of a sudden, you get this emergency call. The training has to happen immediately. And as good instructional designers, good trainers, can we pull it off? Absolutely. Having said that, the, the faster you try to implement training, the more likely you are to have problems. The training won't be designed quite right. It's not on the right performance problem. You start losing some of the transfer learning principles. Supervisors are not involved. And, and, and all those things together means the training may not be nearly as effective. Are you going to be given the, the, the amount of time you need? Probably not. Um, we always want more time than maybe is available. At a minimum, if, you, if it's a short time frame, involve the supervisors as much as you can and build in the action plan tool and make sure those, the, the people coming to training know up front they're going to be doing action planning, they're going to be doing implementation problem solving as part of the course, and they're going to be expected to complete an action plan, and there'll be some level of follow-up afterwards. At a minimum, do that, um, and that'll, I think, Hopefully, it will help uh, improve the uh, the transfer. Um, let's see, I got a comment here from like Joe. He says, uh, "If no difference is happening post training, does does it mean the desired uh, the future state the, the goal has been forgotten or was never really committed to in the first place?" Um, and again, it's a it's a good point, Joe. That um, everybody, as they used to say, I lived in Oklahoma for a number of years, and when everybody's singing out of the same hymn book. It's critical before you roll out training that everybody, as far up the chain as you can get, is in agreement on um, here's the performance problem, here's how it links to correcting this will uh, link to our vision, our bottom line. Here's the, the rat organizational rat, the business reasons for doing this. Uh, here's other factors that may be affecting performance, but the knowledge and skill parts of the training. Um, if you find there's no difference post training then people are going to say, well, the first response is, well, the training is no good. Well, that may be the case. Maybe the training is poorly designed, poorly delivered. You didn't have a subject matter expert delivering it. But it could also be the training was perfect. I mean, the training, you had the right people there. It was very interactive. It was participatory. Learners were engaged. They, uh, they were assessed. They gave each of the feedback. They, uh, they, they demonstrated a mastery of the knowledge and skills. Um, but when they went back, um, either they didn't apply it or it wasn't a training problem to begin with. And those are very embarrassing questions to have a, to, as a trainer or as an instructional designer to have to answer and, and say, well, no, but the training was, was well designed. But if there's no, it's just if there's no post-training, doesn't, if that's not what we were looking for, then um, did we have the wrong performance problem or are we not, uh, 
Are there other factors affecting performance? Are the supervisors not involved? And you do not want to face those kind of questions. You want to be able to, you want to try to answer those questions before you design the course, before you implement the course. So afterwards, you, you, you've done your best to make sure that post-training that the workers are performing as was required um, by the initial assessment in, in order to improve their performance. Because again, it's, those are, are very embarrassing questions to, um, to have to ask. Um, you know, this is how to reinforce it after, bring the folks back to the vision. One of the things, and that's part, Joe, of, I think of the support, the support network is, um, and we've had requests, the superintendent training course, I just did one in, in Vancouver, British Columbia a few weeks ago, and I always get the same comment on the evaluation forms. Bring this group, this group back together annually to recharge us. And what they're saying was they came out of this, it's a blended learning course, they complete an online component, and then they, once they do that, they come to the live course, it's all problems, it's team-based problem solving, a construction problem kind of course, and they love it. And the response always is, bring us back together periodically to recharge. And I think what they're saying is, bring us back together to go over the fundamental principles, put us in more problem-solving activities, refresh us. And I think that what they're saying is, we want support afterwards. We don't want to just leave the training and know that's the end of it. Unfortunately, I don't have the budget to do that. Um, and I recommend it to the, the folks in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, out in Western Canada, they may want to think about doing that. I couldn't budget for it, but you know they want to do that. So that reinforcing afterwards can be as simple as follow-up emails, uh, but can also be more complex with with site visits, with follow-up surveys, with working with our supervisors, with bringing together for refreshers, um, sending out success stories. If you tra if you train folks, and you hear one of your folks saying, "Oh, I went back, I did this, it worked great," taking that idea and sending it back on everybody else, saying, "Hey." Joe just tried this and he found out this really works well and sharing those success stories, those again trying to keep that that spirit alive once the training is uh, is, is completed. Um, Lynn says hopefully a good training needs analysis uh, would help and you're exactly right. Um, uh, wouldn't this be done after performance analysis and Lynn I think there's some terminology issues and I was doing a, uh, I was doing a uh, uh, a presentation ASTD, Riverside Training Development International Conference, a number of years ago. And I asked the group, I sent out about 100 people in the room, and I said, what do you call those statements that you present at the beginning of a course that describe what the learner will know or be able to do at the end of, of the training? And all these hands go up. I took the first 10 people. I had terminal objective, training objective, instructional objective. I had 10 different names for the objectives, because in their organization they call them different things. Um, in terms of the assessments, I've used um, uh, a training needs assessment, but also a performance analysis or performance assessment. Some of those things can mean the same thing. Now, you can get really in the details and say, well, this could be a little difference, the nuance is a little difference, but in, in my mind, whatever you call it, um, when you have the luxury of being able to really go and look at those workers in the work environment with and do an assessment, whether you observe, interview, talk with them, and have a clear picture of what is the performance problem and what are what's the cause of that problem, and if everyone agrees on that, then not only is your design of your course much more accurate, you're much more likely to have changes in performance after after that. So. Uh, but, but absolutely, if you do that kind of front-end analysis, whatever you call it, um, and that feeds into your design and also into your transfer learning after the training, you're more likely to, uh, to really make a difference. And Beth says, we create discussion forums for, a, uh, uh, for social networking, site so Yammer. Um, I do a lot of that yammering, but I'm not a Yammer person. To share success and to use as a forum and ask for their peers for advice. I think it's an excellent idea. If you have a, a social network or some sort of network where they can share success stories, share problems, share things they've done, you can post additional job aids, additional references, and they learn to come to that for support. That again, that is just an extension of the training into the work world that helps um, uh, help uh, uh, support that performance. 
Uh, Lynn's talking about a performance gap analysis. And um, again, um, Matt Lisa training needs analysis. If you combine them, especially if time is short, absolutely. And again, a lot of these terms mean similar but slightly different things. And when you get into detail, uh, courses looking at them, uh, and I've done you know training needs assessment, performance needs assessments, and gap analysis. Again, whatever whatever terminology you use, it's really taking a hard look at um, the work environment and the worker, and what it's going to take to improve their performance. If it's knowledge and skills, building the training around that, and then the, the support network afterwards to help uh, help support that. Um, Go on. I'm, I'm going to keep moving on. Greg, you tell me to shut up. Um, no, you're doing fine. Keep going. Okay. Um, Jessica wrote about you know, why why training fails. She asked, "Have you ever been in a situation where you uh, designed, deploying training, realized that there's another issue besides lack of knowledge and skills? How do you backtrack?" Um, I really couldn't give her an example, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, the last thing you want to do is a uh, performance instructional design training professional is to design and deliver training and then find out it wasn't a training problem um, because that kills the credibility. In fact, USAID this, that funded a lot of Japago programs in some countries, they said, literally said, no more training. We spent too much money on training, we've not seen changes in performance. And so um, from that point on, you have to do a lot better job programmatically of showing that, that it's not training in isolation. And you do want to face those kind of questions. You want to um, do that front-end analysis up front, get stakeholder support, supervisor support, design the training, and then you're much better positioned to support the training afterwards and, and demonstrate, show, there's been a change in uh, in performance. Um, I want to see other other talk about support networks. Um, can you speak? Uh, let's see. Let's see. All right, can we answer? Who asked this question? This is all. This is also from Jessica said. Uh, can you speak to some of the challenges your organization faces as far as design, training, deployed at a distance, culture barriers, delivery issues, and so forth? Um, and I'd really like to hear maybe even from Greg on this one. Um, we've got a blended learning course. We got we only have one, so I don't have extensive experience. Um, but it'd be like the group here. Um, if, if all the students tonight were scattered all over the country, and we're working in different offices or even worse, working independently, uh, working at a distance out of their home and so forth. The follow-up um, assessment of performance, getting supervisor support is a lot more difficult than when you're working in a, uh, a situation where the person's going to stop work, go down the hall to training, go right back to work. They're in a, a production facility, a hospital, a clinic somewhere where they're where you can actually observe them interacting with, with clients, patients, equipment, uh, where you can actually observe their performance. Where you're at a distance from someone, it makes it more difficult. And you may have to look at some of the, the, the virtual support things we talked about earlier. And um, uh, whether you post things on, on the website, have a listserv, have a, a social network, um, share success stories, the, the biggest challenge with that is it takes someone to champion it. And uh, most folks who are in instructional design training have so many things going on to try to maintain that network is a challenge. But if there is somebody, and maybe you can um, find a supervisor, maybe you can uh, have one of the participants who, who is able to do that, but someone who's, who's looking at how do we support this person in a, 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 virtual, uh, a virtual environment. Um, Joe, I saw your question there about USAID. I've been away from them for a while, but if you send me an, an email, you've got my email address there, I'll be glad to um, maybe offer a couple suggestions and, and uh, um, at least point you to someone you can maybe you can be better qualified to, to answer that question. Um, K 
Caroline, Caroline had asked the question earlier. We talked about that. Um, Caroline actually said the transfer learning matrix is very comprehensive and informative, um, but may not be realistic to implement. And I'll be the first to agree, even in our world, we develop that guide, but depending on the situation, depending on the country, and depending on who was paying for the training, because the uh, in each country, the folks in the healthcare system who were our contacts may or may not be supportive things. So we may not have always been able to do everything we wanted. And that's a challenge. And so um, she asked me, she asked, are there key actions for each of the roles, supervisors, trainers, and coworkers? And, and I agree that matrix is comprehensive. What I would recommend in your own organization is to take a look at the matrix. Um, you could do your own matrix jokes if you watch those movies at this point, but, um, and adapt it to create one that fits your organization. But at a minimum, um, the ones I, I gave, uh, uh, and, and I think um, Dr. Williams is going to send out my responses to everybody, I, I, I'd say, I said there were four things. If I had to pick four things out of that matrix to do, if that's all I could do, which ones would be the most important? And I've been saying these all evening. Um, one, I would want a clear definition of the performance of problem and agreement that training is needed. And again, I'll go that one again. I want a clear definition of the performance of problem. Any front-end analysis you do is going to result in one or more clear statements of the performance problem and agreement from all the stakeholders that, yes, this is a training problem or at least partially a training problem. So everybody agrees up front that training is going to correct the problem or part of that. I want, that's, that's key. Two, I would want to involve supervisory personnel before, during, and after training. Uh, three, uh, require participants to develop action plans, clearly show how they're going to uh, apply their new knowledge, skills, and attitudes on the job. And then try to build in follow-up visits or some sort of support system. To me, those are the four things. Clear depth, agreement on the performance problem, um, supervisors involved, action plans, and then follow-up visits or support. All the other ones, I think, enhance those and are, are also important. But if, you, if I only could do those four, those would be the, the ones I would try to build into every training that, uh, that I did. Um, Matthew asked about the occasionally encounter resistance um, or, or lack of buy-in from supervisors, workers, and others. And the answer to that is yes. Um, people don't like change. Um, and in any organization, um, a lot of times change may come from the top and people may or may not always agree with the change. And it, there's a lot of folks who will think, well, this is the, 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 the change du jour. I just need to wait a couple of months, and this will pass like it has before, and we'll go back the way we've always done things. Um, so it, it, it sometimes it's not, it may be resistance, or it may be just being passive about it, not really wanting to do it. Um, and that's why you need um, buying and support at the highest level if you're really going to try to really impact worker performance. Um, you know, so again, that, that key stakeholder involvement is, is, uh, is critical. <coughs> um, let's see. Um, Lynn asks, uh, how would you define transfer of learning versus learning retention? And to me, the, the terms are, are similar, but to me, the difference is the change in job performance. Um, if somebody comes to a training course, three months later, I can do a follow-up visit and give them an assessment or ask them questions, do a test, whatever. They may have retained everything. They retained it all, but they've not changed their performance. They're not doing anything different in their day-to-day -day work. And, and that's the bottom line why we designed all this, was to change their work performance. So, um, we want them to retain that. We want them to actually apply it. And I think that's why I, I really stress the role of having the supervisors involved, the support network, the follow-up, doing everything we can to make sure they actually change their, um, their performance. I'll give you a radical example. When I went with the, the iron workers um, about 10 years ago, um, they were doing some training on the use of Word. 
<clears throat> and there was still a, a number of, of support staff in the building still had WordPerfect on their computers. And you can guess what happened. People would go to the training on Word, but they still sitting there with WordPerfect on their computers. They went back and did WordPerfect. So um, announcement went, went off that, that uh, by next Monday morning, WordPerfect would be removed, removed from all computers. And uh, that got our percent. Well, the interest in the Word training went through the roof because they knew they had to change their performance because of the change in the, in the software. So getting that support um, is, is critical. Um, Lynn this says, and some of the transfer learning has a motivation component, and I would agree 100%. In the training course, when you're doing a training course, you want to integrate throughout that course to keep referring to, now when you go back to work next week, or when you go back to work tomorrow, here's what we expect. Here's, here's how you do this. Uh, tell us why this won't work tomorrow. And I want to get them motivated thinking about how to change their performance. And hopefully the trainers are bringing that excitement into the classroom. Um, or online, and, and, and again, but yeah, getting that, uh, um, that motivation is, is, uh, is, is critical, um, even if you have to take the computer software off. Um, uh, question here, this, one, this was from also from Lynn, said, if you have no practical to evaluate students once training is over, um, can you build components of training to help ensure the transfer of learning? And again, this was back to the situation where um, you, you can't uh, do the follow-up. What I would try to do is, during the training, build as much practice situations that are as real as possible. And I'll give you an example. I was doing the marketing seminar last week, and um, one of the role plays that they do is, is how to make a marketing phone call to a contractor. This would be for, for an iron worker. Um, organizer or a, a business development person calling a contractor and what we found is if I bring them into the center of the room and I put two chairs back to back and have them actually get their cell phones out they don't actually call to sit next to each other but they can't see each other and I found that role play is much more realistic than when I have them seek and when they can see each other because when they go out to make phone calls in their office they're not going to be looking at the person and so we tried to make the role play as real as possible so that, that when they face this, when they go back to work, which would be this week, if they try it, what they're doing is very similar to what they did during the training. So again, I want to make sure that the training is realistic as possible and it puts them in scenarios and examples just like they're going to see on the job. And that helps facilitate the transfer because if I'm in a training course, I'm sitting there thinking, this crap does not relate at all to what I do, I lose interest, I'm not going to apply it. But if I look at it and go, wow, this is exactly what I face every day on the job, I'm more likely to remember that when I go back, particularly if my supervisor is, uh, is encouraging that. Um, and, and Greg, I think I just got to the end of the list of questions. So. Um, uh, I've I, I killed that. Matthew says the trainer has to be very aware of the environment the trainee works in. Again, I could not agree more. Um, if I come in, um, and in the days where I did a lot of consultant work, if I was coming into an organization, I tried to study about the organization as much as possible because, um, and if I could get there in advance to spend a little time watching and talking to people because if the trainer isn't aware of what that work environment's like, they can't give relevant examples, they can't relate to the person, and then the participants uh, disconnect from the training. They, they, uh, they, they're no longer engaged because it just doesn't relate to me. I can't apply this. But if the training is uh, really relates to what they do and it's as real as possible, um, you know, when we do, when we did, I was with Japigo when we did the infection prevention training. Um, we actually drew a sink on a flip chart in the front of the room. So when they were practicing the procedure and they first looked at it, said, why, why, why would, what, what's that for? Because I would always wash my hands. I said, no. The step in the checklist says the very first step, wash your hands. And, and we actually uh, put a, a, drew a sink and they had to go over and actually show the hand motions right up against the flip chart like it was a real sink. 
because we think if they just skipped that, our concern was when they went back next week, they wouldn't go wash their hands. We wouldn't get in that habit. So try to make the real the training as realistic as possible, and the trainers know as much about that work environment as possible, and that's the um, the, the most the, that motivation level helps them connect to what they're um, what they're going to be doing. Um, Greg, like I said, I finished up. I think most of the, of the, of the questions are there. Okay. Other questions people want to either chat or ask. I'd be glad to. Um, Folks, other questions you might have. You got a great resource here to ask. Comments, observations? Okay, I'm not hearing anybody, so I'm assuming there's no questions or comments. Yeah, they, 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 maybe they all dozed off out there. Well, um, okay, we're people are chatting in now, so I, I see. Okay. okay. I see Beth chatting in and Lynn chatting in. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's saying she's not sleeping. That's good. All right, folks. So what I will do is um, I will post Rick's responses to... Um, your questions, he sent me a, a document, and I will post that up on the Blackboard site. Um, when the video is done processing for tonight's course, I will post that um, up there on the course site in Blackboard as well. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Rick for his uh, presentation and um, his sharing of his knowledge and information. Um, he was uh, very diligent about making his information um, available to uh, us in the class prior to the class. So uh, it's still up there if, if you want that. If people want the slides, uh, they are there. And he has a, a separate handout as well. Um, so Greg, my, thank you very I much. My, my email address is there. It's my work email. And, and again, if I can be of any help to anybody, feel free to, um, to email me. And I'll be glad to, to, to try to help or, or um, do, do whatever I can. I, I, I've mm -hmm. been doing training now for 30 some years, and I love it. And it's a uh, you know, design delivering training is a, is a is a great career. So um, if I can help in any way, I'd be glad to. Okay. Uh, I see Lynn is asking, can you get the video in a format other than WMV? That's what um, GoToWebinar produces it in. So if if you want to download it and then uh, change it to a different format, uh, that's that's up to you. But um, it doesn't come in a different format. It records it in that. So um, I'm not sure if you're having a problem with that or not, but um, that's that's what we have. Um, okay. Um, before we say good night for uh, tonight, what I want to do is uh, again thank thank Rick for his time and uh, his expertise uh, in, in sharing. So Rick, we really appreciate you. Um, taking some of your valuable time to uh, share your expertise with, with our class. Thanks so much. No problem. It's been, it's been great, and, and, and good luck. You, you folks have picked a great career. There's lots of opportunities out there. All right. Well, thank you.